All right, it's six o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Hope that you are all here in the right place. We're here to hear from Tony Morosevich about Spell Heaven and other stories in conversation with Celeste Chan. We are so thrilled that you're here with us. I want to let you know that we've partnered with your fabulous local queer independent bookstore, Fabulosa Books, and our trusty chat monitor will be putting in the link in the chat for you to purchase this book. And of course, you can always check this out from your local library as well. So hello and welcome, everyone. My name is Cristina Mitra, and I'm the program manager for the Hormel LGBTQIA Center of San Francisco Public Library. It is my utter pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program with Tony Morosevich in conversation with Celeste Chan. Woo! We're all in for such a treat. Before we begin, I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. So we are on Ohlone land. And this is a land acknowledgement that was developed in partnership with the American Indian Cultural District of San Francisco, which I believe is one of its kind and hopefully uh, the, a model for many more throughout our nation. The San Francisco Public Library acknowledge, com, excuse me, the San Francisco Public Library Commission acknowledges that we occupy the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone peoples, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that the Ramatush Ohlone understand the interconnectedness of all things and have maintained harmony with nature for millennia. We honor the Ramatush Ohlone people for their enduring commitment to Mother Earth. As the indigenous protectors of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatush Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as caretakers of this place as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as first peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush community. We recognize to respectfully honor Ramatush peoples, we must embrace and collaborate meaningfully to record indigenous knowledge in how we care for San Francisco and all its people. Thank you, that's the land acknowledgement. And we just wanted to recognize that since the library is an institution dedicated to free and equal access information, we hope that the land acknowledgement inspires you to reflect on this history and appreciate indigenous people's culture, history, and ongoing contributions to society. Thank you. I have some brief announcements to begin before we hear from our fabulous writers and authors. We do have some wonderful programs coming up here at the Hormel LGBTQIA Center. This Sunday, please don't miss, in partnership with Foglifter Press, generational treasures, an afternoon of queer and trans storytelling. Truly not an afternoon to be missed. And that is back here on our virtual library at 2 p.m. this Sunday, the 25th. Look for the link for registration in the chat. We're really excited that we're starting off a new zine making meetup every third Tuesday here at the main library in the Paley Room. It's at six o'clock starting October 18th. Everyone is welcome, even if you think you don't have a creative bone in your body, we, you are so welcome. We actually know that people have attended this workshop, never created a zine before, and now are on a zine making frenzy. So you too can be inspired. All of these programs are brought to you by the Hormel LGBTQIA Center. And if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. We are a unique, dedicated space for LGBTQIA history, arts, culture, and memory. We're truly one of our kind in an urban public library. Since 1996, we've been the gateway for all kinds of library offerings related to the LGBTQIA community. That means we have over 10,000 books, over 200 archival collections, public programs, and community partnerships to make sure that your LGBTQIA needs are met um, all throughout the year. So if you have ideas about things you'd like to see at the center, books you'd like us to carry, um, archives that you think would be interesting to us, please reach out to us. You can email us at hormel at sfpl.org. 
And you can also follow us on Facebook. And we'd love for you to sign up for a newsletter, which we curate each month with book lists, upcoming programs, and community offerings. Okay, at long last, what you're all here for, this wonderful program that we have set up for you tonight. It's my very wonderful pleasure to introduce our two special guests. Tony Morosevic grew up in a Croatian American fishing family in Everett, Washington. Shout out to the PNW folks. Previous books include Pink Harvest, The Takeaway Bin, Queer Street, My Oblique Strategies, and The Rooms We Make Our Own. She is an alumna of McDowell, Hedgebrook, Jurassic Resident Artist Program, amongst others, a multiple Pushcart Prize nominee, and she named San Francisco Library Literary Laureate. Thank you for that, Tony. After early years working in various labor jobs, she began teaching creative writing at San Francisco State University in 1991. Go Gators! A professor emeritus of creative writing at San Francisco State, she lives with her wife in California. Woohoo! Give it up for Tony. <laughs> And then before I invite Tony to speak, I'm going to introduce our other special guest, Celeste Chan. Celeste moved to San Francisco in search of creative community in 2004. Since that time, she founded and directed Queer Rebels. Whoop, whoop. I've enjoyed many, many of those amazing shows. Curated experimental films for Mix NYC. Created a one-woman show and toured, toured with Sister Spit. She taught Queer Ancestor writing workshops for LGBTQ youth for four years, and now she is writing her memoir. Please go ahead and unmute and welcome with all your love, Tony and Celeste. Take it away, folks. <laughs> welcome, Tony and Celeste. <laughs> That's great, that is great. Wonderful. It's great to see friendly faces across the Zoom screen. And thank you so much, Kevin and Christina and Tony and your new book. Oh my goodness, congratulations. Well, thank you. But, and that was, again, that was wonderful, uh, Christina. That was just a, a, great, a great intro. And I know Kevin is behind the scenes doing lots of um, important stuff, but uh, you all have been so welcoming to us. So um, thank you. Celeste, uh, it is a big old treat to be chatting with you and, um, and to see the rest of, uh, of you out there who have your screens on. And even if you don't have your screens on, I'm picturing you. So thank you for being here. And I have Tony to thank for the hey, screen behind me. <laughs> <laughs> I can bring you the ocean anytime you want. Just ask me, I'll, I'll bring it to you. Uh, and so what do we do now, Christina? You know, we're so such pros at this. <laughs> we're such pros that we've kind of gone through it and now we're fatigued and now we need to be told what to do. Is that what, how it goes? <laughs> Whatever uh, no, you... Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Take it Let's away. Let's go. Let's go. Wait, um, Celeste, start us off. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. Um, Tony, I wondered if you might want to read a passage from the book and tell tell us a bit more about it. I yeah, I would love to. I mean, I've <laughs> yes. Oh no, it's disappearing into the sea. But please tell <laughs> us. <laughs> the book disappeared into the sea. That is perfect. That's actually just perfect. Um, well, uh, you know, for um. For people who haven't uh, heard about the book, so uh, it it is actually based on uh, life events that I've fictionalized. And so there is a queer couple, and they move to a seacoast town. Um, they aren't initially uh, welcomed into their neighborhood um, with open arms. Uh, and uh, then, and what happens is that the narrator grew up in a uh, in a uh, Croatian American fishing family and immigrant community up in the Northwest. And so when she ends up in an academic world, it feels really foreign to her. It feels um, just very, very foreign. So what she um, what she's decides to do is she go, decides to go down to a place that she feels very familiar. And the familiar place is the sea. 
And um, there's a quote at the start of the book uh, from C.D. Wright, the wonderful uh, poet C.D. Wright. And it is, um, you will wake up in a year, in a dear yet unfamiliar place. You will wake up in a dear yet unfamiliar place. And the thing is, is that the sea is uh, familiar to the narrator. Um, but this is a new place, so it's unfamiliar, it's dear yet unfamiliar. And when she gets down there, she finds, um, you know, in the academic world, she didn't, it felt very foreign to her, but somehow this group of outsiding, outsider community down by the beach, beach, she feels very comfortable. She suddenly feels comfortable with this group. So um, the very start of the book, I'm gonna read just a real short passage at the start. Um, it's from a piece called The Devil Wind. And uh, initially, this narrator goes to some pier even farther down the coast because um, she wants to get close to something that feels familiar. So here's the devil wind. A chill settles on the empty crab boxes stacked around the storage room, a chill that doesn't so much descend as rise up from the sea below the crab fishery, up through the planks of the pier on which the fishery stands, through the concrete first floor where the crab, tub, tub, <laughs> crab tubs hold their incarcerated. A chill that climbs the wet stairs to the storage room door, doesn't bother to knock, comes right in, carrying with it the smell of crab and diesel and brined to find me here where I sit at a makeshift desk with a pen in hand, the pad of paper before me turning to pulp in all of this wetness, the page on top, a damp blank screen, which stays empty. Why go to the small tight window of the page when a bigger page beckons, a large picture window right above the desk that looks out on the harbor? Why sit when you can stand and watch crab boats ferry in and out and see them head to sea empty, riding high above the harbor surface with their barnacled keels showing their pants hitched up high. Then watch their return in the evening, the waddling procession after a heavy meal of cod or halibut or salmon, their belt lines well below the water. If I can stand, I can see the Lucy or the Intrepid or the Irene B pull up to the dock right outside see the dock's rusty crane swing out over a boat. The roped basket at the end of the cable's hook swings down like an empty string bag you take to market, only to come up full to bursting with crabs, their red arms gesturing this way, this way and that, with so much to say. Out past the breakwater at the horizon, a straight blue line of sea bisects the sea white sky's blank screen. Waves scribble their cursive below the line, filling up that page. A reminder, I'm supposed to be writing, working, yet have no precedent for this type of work. There's nothing in my DNA. This isn't the work of my captain, the my father, the life and death job of a fishing boat captain on the wicked Bering Sea, nor the work of my mother, her youth spent standing on her feet all day, packing tuna, before child labor laws gave the cannery owners a conscience. People ask how I found this place. I tell them I was looking for a new perch, that I walked out onto this pier one day and simply asked the owner of the fishery, a man named Dan, if there was a place around here where I could write. See, I told him, I grew up around boats. The smell of brine is perfume to me, the smell of twine, of diesel, perfume. I know how to lay it on thick know how to bullshit, having learned this on the docks when I was young. I know how to swear, how you say you motherfucking piece of shit with conviction. I told Dan I had this half-baked theory. If I were near the sea again, on a dock again, maybe I'd be able to tap into that salty vein of memory, recall tales I heard listening to the fishermen bullshit. What if, like them, you awoke each morning and looked forward to the day's prospects, the shining possibilities of luck and work and weather. What if you could look forward to the adventure no matter the con consequences, throw caution to the wind and believe there would be a wind? Now that I've gained the perch, how do I get past the window in front of me? How do I get from this chair onto that sea? How do I get to that life from this life? 
That's the dilemma. And that's her dilemma. How does she get there? How does she, how does she um, leave the interior world of academia and get outside and out to a world that feels expansive and larger and full of memory? Um, so um, she starts, she better head on down to the sea is what she better do. She better head down to that place right behind your head, Celeste. That's what she better do. <laughs> right here, <laughs> right, <laughs> right, the sea that you've given me. Yeah, well, what a wonderful place to start, Tony. I feel like there's so much there, like that, um, that line that you said about the salty vein of memory and the, um, and I think trying to, both trying to reclaim that past, like this narrator is, I, like I hear within that, the struggle to be an artist, um, being, uh, trying to get closer to those um, fishermen stories, to the past, to family, and then being in this, um, like I feel like there's transformation or possibility within what you just read. And I wondered um, if in the process of Gosh, originally I was going to ask you what sparked the collection, but perhaps I'm going to add to that. <laughs> so it's both like what what sparked the collection for you, and then it's also um, was there was there anything surprising as you were writing as these stories were coming together? Yeah, you know, I think the surprising thing um, for me, uh, well, there were a number of surprises, but one was that. Um, the stories were built over time and they were, again, they uh, came from life events that I fictionalized. But initially, this narrator goes for this walk and while the people are unfamiliar, they're familiar, they're, they're how shall I say this? They're familiar unfamiliars. They, um, they talk a language that she feels comfortable talking. They don't, um, it's not elevated. Um, it's like, let's just, uh, what I call the art of bullshit. They know how to tell a good story. And so, well, let's just tell a story and I'll tell you one and you tell me one. And, and the other part that I think that starts to surprise me in it is that over time, the narrator, I think feels a certain, I don't know, I don't know if other people feel this, but a certain loneliness, just a loneliness in the world. Um, a loneliness, even though she's uh, happily partnered, um, there's a certain lonely feeling in that these little, these little tiny encounters with human beings end up being the things that lift her and that she slowly, um, she slowly starts to see that some of her assumptions about people, like, oh, that guy's a drunk on the bench. Oh, that woman's living in her car with her kid. And, and, and you know, all the little assumptions that you come up with and storylines about people. Well, she starts to find out that those storylines are really, um, that the assumptions aren't very useful if you're getting, um, if you go just a bit deeper. And so over time, slowly, she, um, that's the surprise of the collection, I think, to me, is that not only that she feels more comfortable down there with, uh, with people than she does in academia, but that she feels closer, less lonely. She learns something that assumptions aren't the best way to operate in the world. She learns some things that she needed to learn. And uh, I don't think she knew what she needed to learn before she went down there. That's how I put it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I definitely see the journey and the transformation through here. And I think um, one of the stories that did really stand out, I mean, many of the stories stood out to me, but I remember that encounter with um, the mother who was living out of her car and um, appeared to be on meth and her little girl. And I remember the narrator's internal struggle. And um, I felt that was handled very sensitively that, you know, do, do I need to intervene? Um, and at one point the narrator's partner says, listen, a present mother is, is better than a dead mother. And I, I think, yeah, I definitely see that like sensitive observing of, and there, there's so much like neighborhood character in here. There's so much of, um, of the people who are in it. 
I actually wonder, um, sorry, jumping around to, to questions. Um, Go ahead. Okay, I'm, I'm jumping the order, Tony. Um, yeah, because I, I, I believe you talked a bit about this, about what it would mean for the narrator to claim a place among the other seaside outsiders, especially after um, time in academia. I was curious about that line in one of the stories, um, and I hope I'm paraphrasing correct, correctly, please correct me if I'm wrong, but quote, if I'd been a different gender, maybe I would have been captain. Um, I wonder if you could speak a bit more about that. Well, I, um, like the narrator, I ended up in a place I didn't anticipate. So uh, I really imagined when I was young and part of the um, part, there's a story that I'll read later who I used to be. And I often like ask people um, who they thought they were going to be, what they wanted to be when they were young. And it usually turns out they're never, they, that, that rarely happens that they turned out what they wanted to be. So, so, the, so the narrator um, assumed that she would uh, do physical work because her parents did physical work and that that's what she would do for her life. She would do um, physical jobs and sometimes be the first woman to do those jobs um, on uh, all male crews, but she would go and do that. And that that was a great way, of, you know, hard work was a great a way to make a living. So she, I think, um, I think she, uh, let me get back to the original question. Um, she's just, su she's surprised she didn't anticipate that she would be land where she landed. And I think that's true for a lot of people. They don't anticipate they would, they landed where they landed. And then you, uh, then you, you make a life from there, but it's, um, it's just not anywhere that I thought I would be or this narrator thought she would be. And so um, I think part of the wonderful thing about teaching, and this is back to um, the good thing about um, teaching at a university and teaching in a creative writing department is that when you were in classes, it was like you were captaining a boat. It was like you were working, working with a crew, like uh, the crew, you're all together. You're all together on this vessel you're inside, um, everyone has to like participate and pull, and now I'm gonna really go with the metaphor, pull in the metaphorical nets. I mean, you remember this, Celeste. I mean, you know, you all have to do it together. And the captain might give you a few little, like, okay, a direction or here, do this, do that. But you all have to work together and it has that same quality inside the classroom sometimes as being maybe a captain on a, on a boat. Um, there is a great, great quote I just read the other day um, from a fisherwoman named Tella Adson. And I was, uh, she's a fisher poet and she fishes up in uh, the Bering Sea with her partner, Joel. And she was in an article the other day and, and the, what it, I wrote it down, what is it? It's not, a, it, it's not the catching part, it's the fishing part. That's, she was talking about fishing. It's not the catching part, it's the fishing part. And I thought, that's just like writing. It's, not, <laughs> it's like, and so I think this is a jumble of things I'm saying, but with teaching and I didn't end up on a boat on the sea as a sea captain, but there was a different type of captaining that happened in teaching writing. And when people would catch an idea, say in class, um, that was pretty cool. <laughs> that was pretty wonderful. Yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah, no, I, I love, I love that fishing metaphor, catching the idea and the, yeah, the fishing for the creative process. Um, I think I, I was curious about, I know that if you've written about happenstance across different genres, um, is it within the Pink Harvest title? I wonder if you could speak more about that kind of possibilities, portals, happenstance. Yeah. I have this little tiny story I want to tell you because <laughs> I think that it happened this week, okay? This is happenstance, okay? Um, and this is real life. Uh, 
my wife and I are going down to the beach with the dogs down to the sea. It's in the afternoon. We have to go down a big hill to get there. And there's a stop sign at the uh, top of the hill. Uh, and we stop and there's two little girls that want to cross the, um, cross the way, cross. And my wife says, okay, go ahead and cross. You can cross. So they're crossing and across the street, there's a woman picking up, um, she's cutting sunflowers in her front yard. She has a number of sunflowers in her front yard. My wife yells out the window, they're beautiful. The woman takes the sunflowers, <laughs> runs across the street, puts them in the open driver's window and says, go, go. And there's cars lined up behind them and behind us. And I couldn't believe it that this woman didn't even think for a moment. She didn't think for a second about generosity. Oh, I think I'll give them this. She just went like that. And then, and as I was leaving, I saw that those two little girls went into that house. And when we're driving back from the beach, still kind of stunned by it, I see the little girls in there in an open garage and there one is singing and one is dancing. They're making up some kind of dance and I wave the sunflowers at them and they all laugh. And it's this, it's an extraordinary moment. It's happens, it just happened out of, it just happened, right? Um, and then, and this is about writing and the creative process. A week before that, there's a woman at the beach named Mary. She's an Irish nurse who uh, came here from Ireland in the 60s, moved to the Haight-Ashbury. Now she's 80, she's a wonderful person. And I knew she was gonna be 80. And um, I went down to the beach, I saw her in her car and I had brought down a small little vase with a little flower in it. And I caught up to her car and got out and handed it through the window to her, okay? And those two events are connected, but they weren't planned. I mean, I was gonna give a flower to Mary, but they weren't planned. So in terms of the creative process, what happens is that this moment of happenstance and this moment beckon to each other and start to come together in a piece of writing. And that happens with memory too. You're walking along and something in the present moment reminds you of something else. And then you put that memory in that piece. So I think happenstance is actually where everything is happening that I'm interested in. <laughs> I don't want anything other than happenstance. <laughs> I mean, do you find that that's true too? I'm going to ask you a question, Celeste. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. I hadn't thought of responding to that question. I think what, what you said made me think a lot about neighborliness and, oh, maybe this is happenstance. I was on Twitter. I saw this Mr. Rogers thread um, where he was saying, um, Mr. Rogers was saying, um, how to forgive someone who's been mean to you that might include yourself so that you can be neighborly to others and that a neighbor is anyone um who you have met i i, I maybe so it it made me I, I was looking at that last night on the internet so maybe maybe there's a resonance it's talking to this book that is in the sea <laughs> but, the, but but you know neighborliness it, it is it does strike me that lately these very little connections with people end up being an extraordinary, um, God, I don't know, a necessary thing to um, during these days, especially during this time. But that's the thing that lifts, right? It's just like a little, well, here, like this woman, I still can't get over that. There's, um, there's a great quote from um, Lucy by the Sea, the new book by uh, um, Elizabeth, Strout, and it's the quote is, What is it like to be you? And I was thinking, What is it like to be that woman? That woman who would just so generously do that, 
I mean, that's where I think where the fiction, can, where you start to imagine things, but it's, uh, it's striking, isn't it? Neighborliness, hey, how you doing? You know, it's a, it, it's a small thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, those moments of connection, those moments of, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think another thing I was thinking of as I read Spell Heaven was um, the, oh no, why is it escaping me? <laughs> those, <laughs> oh, jump over here. Uh, oh yeah, I, I was really, I think, struck by the moments you included on the page of like imagining into the what if and into the gaps. And, and you, you have that here. And I think sp speaking of portals to memory, which you mentioned earlier, I remember that moment in the story, the one second sandwich where um, one moment the narrator's in the classroom and there's a trigger and then it's, um, we're tumbling back into memory. We're going back into, we're going back into this other action. I wonder if you could speak more about some of those tumbles into memory. Well, doesn't it happen just instantaneously? It just happens. Yeah. I mean, you know, you uh, in that story, uh, the narrator's in the classroom. There's a, a student who's who ends up doing a presentation on Robert Olin Butler's book *Severance* about what happens uh, to historical figures when they are beheaded. And there's the last 200, 240 minutes. No, not 200. Two and last two. 200 words they think, God, I can't, I have to go back and look at it. It's this little short period of time that you still have consciousness. And so this kid in class is doing that and that triggers in the narrator that her best friend's mother was decapitated in an um, accident when she was young. Also, that class is about teaching lessons and in the memory, she and her best friend learned from that mother how to make a one second sandwich. So, so it just, the memory just, if you allow it, you dive into it every other second. You're talking with a person and they've had an operation and you immediately think of, oh God, I remember what it was like to be in the hospital. So your dives, you immediately just start diving. But if you include that in the writing, then it becomes a kind of a weave that you're in the present and then you dive, and then you're in the present, and then you dive. And um, that's a particular type of movement in writing that can keep some sense of momentum and a kind of a thickening, maybe. You write, I mean, you write um, also memoir, and you're writing a memoir now. And I mean, is, there's, because we've worked together, you know, there's like the present, and then there's just, it's just, it's a natural fall into memory. I think that if you keep yourself in the present, that's the time when it feels a little bit more, at least to me, a little bit more claustrophobic. So it's pleasurable journeys to the past or, yeah. and or complicated, yeah. And or complicated, that's right, right? Yeah. Good. So yeah, because that that dive in the, the past was like a whole journey as well, like the story of the friendship, the story of that tragic accident. But yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, um, well, maybe I should uh, read one uh, one story from the, the piece. And uh, what do you think? That sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, there is, I'm going to read one kind of uh, a, a story from the piece that's toward the end, just to give you a little bit of the flavor of the people uh, that she meets. And uh, this happens more towards the end of the piece, end of the book. Um, it's a, a man that she sees every day at the beach. And uh, it's about also who we used to be. Um, that's the other thing, another um, thread in the book. The uh, narrator used to be uh, used to be other people, um, other jobs, other worlds, other uh, communities that she grew up in. And uh, then, uh, then you uh, look back on that a little bit. So who I used to be. I can tell from the start of my walk on the beach promenade that he's at his post, can spot the top of his faded baseball cap in the distance. The rest of his body is obscured by a concrete tape concrete casement housing a trash can. But as I get closer, I see his legs crossed at the knee, 
his tan gans, his flip flops. A few more steps up pops his face, florid, flushed eyes at half staff, smile on full beam. He's where he is every day, all day, in his spot, on the bench, kitty corner to the Chat and Chew Cafe, in the pier, where he holds forth, holds court, holds my attention whenever I pass. His spot. One morning a few months ago, I mentioned to Crystal, the counterperson at the of the Chat and Chew, that the guy sitting on the bench outside told me the weather was about to change. Oh, you must have been talking to Tommy Bench, she says. That's what we call him. That's Tommy out there, and that's his bench. She went on to tell me that he was once a checker at Safeway. As soon as she said this, um, I remember seeing him when my wife and I first moved to this town, standing behind the checkout counter, dressed in the official Safeway uniform, short sleeved shirt, navy blue apron, blue tie, shiny name badge, bantering with the customers as he scanned the groceries. Crystal says he lost that job and never found another. That was years ago. What does he live on now? I notice his buddies often bring him a can of beer when his supply gets low. Here's looking at you, kid, he once yelled, then raised his can in a bag and, to and toasted me as I passed. Tommy, Tommy and I have our own form of chit chat. I'll say something about the weather, about the local baseball team. What about those giants? And he'll have some funny comeback. I laugh and give a short wave and carry on with my walk. I never hang around for a longer chat. My wife says it's because I'm a solitary, but maybe it's that I just don't know where the conversation might lead. We're from such different worlds. I toss out writing lessons to students at the university, a very privileged position. Tommy tosses out bon mot to the sea seagulls, his privileged perch. I've worked a lot of blue collar jobs in the past, truck driver, laborer, swimming pool operator, attic insulation, but that was before I landed a job in the halls of academia. What would he and I have, would he and I have anything in common now? Something that would tip the scales in our favor. Tommy has colored up. It's obvious he's a drinker, an alcoholic, or as Stevie once called him, a drunkard. I told her that drunkard was such an archaic word that the word harkened back to skid row and prohibition in songs like Little Brown Jug. Well, hearken isn't too modern now either, is it, she replied. The glassy eyes, the unfocused gaze, the slurred speech, the ever-present brown paper bag at his side crinkled around a beer can. There are the obvious signs. Tommy sits on his bench every morning and afternoon, deeply pickled, in a Hawaiian t-shirt, cargo pants, a baseball cap. Propped up against his bench is the driftwood walking stick he carries with him wherever he goes, more like a staff than a walking stick like a staff a drunken apostle would use to lead his flock. There's Permit Man, who has a running feud with the bake re re break repair shop near his house. Something about the shop not having a permit. He made a plywood cutout of a not so cutesy clown, nailed it to his backyard fence that faces the shop. The cartoon bubble coming out of the clown's mouth reads, got permit? Call 1-800-SCUMBAG. There's the chewer who talks out loud to himself as he walks, a running stream of conspiracy theories about the government, Jesus Christ, Richard Nixon, Medicare fraud, Medicare fraud, who chews and spits sunflower seeds, leaving a trail of split seeds in his wake. There's Happy Day, who always says those two words and only those two whenever I see him. I hear he used to be a merchant marine. Every day, each one finds a spot on the bench to chat with Tommy, to chew the fat and shoot the breeze. Tommy's always at the head of that welcome wagon. He's always ready to share a sip and a smoke, is rarely alone on that set of bar stools. With a black magic marker, he's inked each person's name on the bench where they always sit, like place cards set out for a fancy dinner party. It's late afternoon by the time I get down to the shore. This is a month later. I button up my jacket, start my walk, spy Tommy's cap in the distance. It had taken Arctic blast to keep him from his bench. When I reach him, I stop, say hey, and we start bullshitting about nothing important, how the giants lost again, how they blew it in the night. I compliment him on his fall outfit, plaid flannel shirt, khaki Bermuda shorts, a royal blue baseball cap I haven't seen him wear before. This one sports the logo of the Golden State Warriors. The cap has a small tear in the, in the brim. 
like the cap, I say. Got it at goodwill, as is, he says, pointing to the tear, like me. As is, I say, or is it as you were? I give him a quick salute and start to move on. Then I stop. I don't know why. My wife says I always have an exit strategy. Maybe it's this feeling I have about not wanting to get too close. Or it could be that only when I'm alone do I feel too free to think my thoughts. I've got something I want to show you, he says. He's slurring his speech a little, but I catch his drift. He reaches into his shirt pocket and pulls out a small square photograph. His hand is shaking as he holds the photo up to me. Here, take a look. I take the photo from his hand, staring back at me, a handsome young guy in his 20s or early 30s, full head of hair, big grin, clear-eyed, confident looking, the look of a guy who can handle whatever life throws at him. It's like Tommy, like I've never seen him, like I've never known him. I used to own a house, he says, up on Sunset Ridge, beautiful deck and everything. The wife got that and everything else. I try to picture him years ago in his prime with his dreams and hopes and plans for the future with his life still ahead of him. You cut quite a figure, I say with a smile. But Tommy's not smiling. He looks me straight in the eye as if to say, look again, damn it, you're missing something. He gives a cough like he's clearing his throat. Then in a voice as serious as I've ever heard him say, he says, this is who I used to be. Who he used to be, not just a guy on this bench with a half can of beer hanging out with the rest of the beach gang, a guy who had a life with a wife, a house, a job, and responsibilities with cash coming in, a person with a pension plan and health coverage, and whatever other benefits a lifetime of indentured servitude to Safeway offers. As if I need more evidence, he lifts his shirt sleeve. There on his skinny forearm, a tattooed column of blue letters runs down to his wrist. I try to decipher the code, but the letters don't combine to make up any word I know. One initial for the name of each member of my family. Mia Familia, he says proudly. A photo, an arm, a beer, the sea, who we used to be. Who was the chewer in a former life or permanent man or happy day or me? I don't tell Tommy that I once worked all those blue collar jobs, that I went to school and wrote some stories and now teach at a university, that I never wanted to follow the rules academic or otherwise that I used to be married, then divorced, then came out and married the love of my life. That when I was young, I wanted to grow up and be a sea captain and watch the waves roll by. That I was once that person and that person and that person. And now this is who I am. A woman walking alone by the sea. A person who's soon to call it a day on that Cush University gig, ready to leave it all behind. All of who I used to be is still in here, tucked inside my shirt pocket, tucked inside the skin. A grocery checker becomes a drunkard. A truck driver becomes a professor. A merchant marine becomes the minister of happiness. Transformers, everyone does. I hand his photo back to him, watch as he slips it in his shirt pocket. He looks up and gives me a grin. There's nothing here to fear. What if I joined Tommy on the bench, if I sat right down next to him? if I didn't rush on and instead left behind my monkish ways, if I went to the local liquor store and brought back a bottle of Four Roses to share, what if like the old timey song, I hearkened back to another gentler time and realized there is no separation in the land beyond the sky, as my friend Henry says, and then went a step further and believed there's no separation right here on earth. If I had a revelation like the monk Thomas Merton once had on the streets of Louisville, that he loved all the people, even those seeming strangers, that none of us were alien to each other. Would Tommy accept me as is? Would the others? I make my move. I walk over to Tommy and sit down. I sit right next to him. He laughs a nervous laugh, then scoots over a bit and laughs again. We both fall silent. We sit there staring out at the sea. Two surfers are trying to catch a few waves. Hey, Tommy, why here every day, this spot, always this same spot? Well, I don't have anywhere else to be. I don't have a job, he says. I don't mention that I once knew that he did. You know, that's not quite true, he adds and gives me a wink. 
I'm in the Coast Guard. Oh yeah? Yeah, I guard the coast. But don't let your guard down. I toss back and he laughs. After a moment, he says, hey, what are you sitting on? This must be his lead up to a joke. So I say in high English, my arse, kind sir. I'll always look down before you sit down. You never know what you'll find. Maybe he's nervous about us sitting so close. Or maybe he stuck chewing gum on the bench. I get up, make a big show of looking down where I'm going to sit. And that's when I see it. New letters inked onto the bench. My name with the drawing of a tiny anchor. There, right there with all the others in the row with the ink names of the surfer dude and crystal and the chewer and permit man with kite man who died from a heart attack last year, his name beginning to fade. Here it is, the proof, the acknowledgement, what I've wanted all along to be accepted, to be in with this out crowd. Jesus, Tom, you have no idea what this means to me, no greater honor, and I can't finish up. I tear up. Tommy turns red, takes a swig from his can. He is embarrassed as I am. To lighten it up, I offer him a line I learned from Crab King. Listen, if I'm lying, I'm dying. I sit back down and put my arm around his shoulder. I don't move on. We sit there together silently for the rest of the afternoon and watch the sunset take the sky through the color spectrum, color after color after color. Um, so. Bravo, bravo. <laughs> so that's, uh, you know, that there's that wonderful quote from Thomas Merton about, and no one, no one is, no one is a stranger. Then, like you know, suddenly this, this sense of oh, these people that you don't know are strangers. You don't know them. You better not get too close. Whatever, and that's true actually. Even in um, in the woman's work world, it's important to, it's important that she makes some kind of. This is it, the line from Toni Morrison, like, um, to vault the mere blue air that separates us is the line. To vault the mere blue air that separates us, that's what she's trying to do. And um, I think she's trying to do that there too. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, who did you used to be, Celeste? Gosh, I was going to say that was so poignant <laughs> that I think especially that moment of the little photograph and that moment of witnessing and then it kind of ripples out like it's it's both about Tommy Bench and it's about the narrator and um, all of these folks who are marginalized and I think not full not fully seen a lot of the time. And I think like that fullness and that richness and that chance, oh my God, going back to happenstance or going back to that possibility, like she does sit down. Yes. There, there is the anchor. <laughs> and, but that's true. The march, the people who are not seen or aren't acknowledged or aren't, don't get in the paper. I think that that, I think that that's very true. And, and again, that she really does start to, she just just starts to see that her job is that she has to open up. She mm -hmm. has to like, she has to say hello. She has to like make a move. I mean, and people have to make a move back. You know, I always say at the beach, you know, you see a person, you see them the first time and you guys, you know, you pass by, oh, it's a stranger. The next time you give them a little <laughs> nod <laughs> and then one day you smile at them. And then the next day you say, hey, and then, you know, and I mean, you know, it's like this slow process, but you know, it's that, that she has to, she has to be willing to be less closed, right? So that's the, um, yeah. Then she founds her, finds her group. Um, yeah. So good. Good. Um, is this the chat time? Do we... <laughs> I think so. I think this is the chat time if folks have questions. And thank you so much, Tony. Like a beautiful reading, that a beautiful journey. Well, and Celeste, you're again, 